Hello, 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 and welcome to this edition of the Jolly Heretic Afternoon Edition. I don't know if the viewers are aware of this, but in England, in, in the old days, pubs didn't even open till three o'clock in the afternoon. But it's 4.30 in the afternoon here, and uh, I have a very special guest for you today, and that is Professor Sam Vaknin, uh, who is an expert on narcissism and also a narcissist himself. And so while I side into the old entropy, I'm going to ask Sam to introduce himself. So Sam, over to you. I'm Sam Vatnin. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, other books on personality disorders, and I'm a professor of psychology. As you have indicated, I've been diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder twice over the span of 10 years. So that that sort of drove me into the field. I see. So that's great. So if you have any, if you, if you, uh, great. So, well, anyway, so welcome to the Jolly Heretic. It's an absolute uh, pleasure to have you here. And uh, cheers, everybody. Cheers, uh, Peter Lovett. Cheers, Sigmund Freud. Cheers, Coughing. Uh, cheers, uh, cheers, Sam. Cheers, uh, Herligan Gurligan. K Piss. Uh, Bloodstained Hands is saying, why now? The answer is because that's, that's when Sam can fit, fit us in. Cheers. Um, Sam's, Sam's on the on, on the red wine here. So I'm, I'm uh, very sorry to my, my American viewers who are, of course, all in bed. Slanger, Slanger Var, Dodgy Dodo, Slanger Var, Capis, Hurligan Gurligan, uh, uh, Saludo, Salu, and all that. And welcome to the Jolly Heretic. Now, people have been commenting that this is uh, on what's called neat time, which is not in education, employment, or training. And that is uh, that is indeed the case. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, so I'm sorry about that. But if you have any questions for Sam on the issue of narcissism uh, in particular, which is what we're going to be talking about today, yes, Capis, Sigmund Oppenheim. Mm. Um, then do, of course, uh, send them in. And uh, American expat here, says Brendan. OK, cheers, Brendan. And hello, CV. Uh, the Jolly Heretic got a reasonable time, says CV. I don't know where you are, but this is this is uh, this is very this is uh, early early drinking. Um, uh, then of course uh, send them in on the old entropy. The link is on the screen uh, or on YouTube, and we will of course answer them today. And the Flam report is saying that I love the Daily Mail article. Yes, Sam was recently in the Daily Mail. I recall reading about that. Yes. Okay, so can you tell us then um, how did you, you you've been you were diagnosed as narcissistic yourself? So. Um, what is it like to be, a, would you say, uh, as a person that's a psychologist and an academic, how would you say, how would you say, what is it like to be a narcissist? Narcissism is not a presence. It's an absence. It's the experience of a void, of a black hole. Now, how can anyone experience an absence? I mean, if you're not there, how can you experience anything? So there must be an entity or a sub-entity which does the experiencing a remnant, perhaps, of the supernova, something left behind after the, the huge uh, explosion of early childhood. The narcissist experiences, undergoes trauma and abuse in early childhood. And then his, the narcissist suspends himself or herself as a child and instead, instead creates an imaginary friend, a false self, which also has the hallmarks of a deity. It's a divinity. And so in many respects, the child exposed to abuse and trauma comes up with a private religion where there's this Moloch, this, this ancient pagan kind of God, the false self. And this false self is everything the child is not. The false self is omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and everything and all and perfect and brilliant and, and so on. And so the, the, this, this emanation takes over the child disappears, vanishes, the, the true self is suppressed and ossified and fossilized, and the false self takes over. Very reminiscent to Frankenstein's creation, or the golem in, in Jewish tradition. It's a monster that takes over. So you're talking to the monster right now, to this, to this concoction, to this piece of fiction, because I, I, I am no longer... Right, so your your real self somehow became extinguished in the in uh, in some point in childhood due to something unpleasant things happening to you or whatever. That's what that's what you're saying. Yes. So what what is the difference then between a fragile narcissist and a are you a grandiose narcissist or a fragile narcissist? Clinically, I'm a psychopathic narcissist. The fragile or vulnerable or shy uh, or covert narcissist. The, the the clinical term is covert narcissist. It's a narcissist who is unable to secure narcissistic supply, unable to garner attention, adulation, admiration directly, either because he is socially anxious or because he is insecure or because he's flooded with shame and guilt from early childhood or because he feels inadequate and inferior for whatever reason. This kind of narcissist cannot just go out there 
in your face and extract extract from you the attention that he craves and needs to regulate his internal environment. So this kind of narcissism is a constant state of frustration, seething and becoming gradually passive aggressive. And um, this is the difference between covert and overt. Now, recently we are coming to the realization that the classic phallic grandiose overt narcissist, the Donald Trump type, is actually a psychopath, not a narcissist. And that the only true narcissist is what we used to call hitherto the covert narcissist. That's the only true narcissist. Because it, this kind of narcissist is compensatory. It compensates. He compensates for an, an innate feeling of inadequacy and inferiority by presenting a facade of superiority and, and you know, grandiosity. Mm -hmm. So... What used to be called narcissists until recently is probably a, a, a variant. If you're, if, you're, if you're compensating, though, then which is what you're saying is true of the grandiose narcissist, uh, then yeah. then isn't there an extent to which you kind of don't really feel it? On is there some level on which you don't really feel it, or are you unpuncturable? Is it that you 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 really you you somehow the is it that the rep? I mean, what I'm I find these these are metaphors we're talking in here, and sometimes they're not a perfect way of explaining something. But but, but I mean, are, are we saying that the the covert narcissist is basically almost a, a less a less successful example of the narcissistic strategy? He has been less able to distinguish to extinguish yes. the, yes. the the, the difference is not the, the difference in, is not in the psychodynamic landscape. All types of narcissists are grandiose. All types of narcissists require narcissistic supply, which is a fancy term for attention. All kinds of narcissists require attention from the outside, feedback. All of them need to be seen in order to regulate the sense of self-worth, self-esteem, self-image and self-perception, etc. All of them. This is common to all narcissists. The difference between the covert and the overt is the covert is less self-efficacious. The covert is less adept and less successful at obtaining supply directly. So he needs to go in a roundabout way. He, some, some covert narcissists team up with overt narcissists, with Donald Trump types. They team up with them in order to vicariously enjoy the supply, kind of moon and sun relationship. Other covert narcissists become passive aggressive and they derive their sense of omnipotence from their ability to sabotage and undermine and obstruct other people, etc. So there, but but until recently, we believed that all of them belong to one big genus, all of them belong to one big family. But now we're beginning to believe that the overt, grandiose, classic kind of narcissist with the braggadocio and the boasting and the bragging and the in-your-face grandiosity and the contempt, this kind of narcissist is actually a psychopath, not a narcissist. We are beginning to believe that the only kind of true narcissist is compensatory. So, yeah, because that's the thing. I, I, when I've looked at this before in my own research, um, the, 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 I find very little difference between the way that uh, whatever his name was, Cl Clackley or whatever his name is, the, the mask of sanity, I forget his name, um, it, uh, describes the 11 markers of psychopathology uh, with how people describe the markers of narcissism. It, they seem to be almost exactly the same. Very Whereas, true. Um, okay, it's, it's it's slightly nuanced difference, but it, it's it's very very, very similar. But with with the with the covert narcissist, that that seems to me to be much more um, distinguishable, well, distinguishable, and, and, and much more kind of in, in my own experience of people that I would guess are a bit like that. That there, there is the, the the losing their temper, the, the the jumping up and down like a child, the 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 return to a childlike state, that sort of thing, which is consistent with some damaged uh, person. Um, rather than just a person that's just congenitally like this, so so I think that's, that's so. So you then, in that sense, you would be a psychopath and not really a narcissist. That, yes, I'm a psychopathic narcissist, which is a hybrid. It's also known as a malignant narcissist. It was first described by Kernberg, Otto Kernberg, in the 70s. It's a narcissist. Okay, what, what, what distinguishes that then from the other two categories that we've we've explored? A psychopathic narcissist is a narcissist who who resembles in behavior and in strategies coping strategies, a psychopath rather than a, a classic narcissist. So he, a psychopathic narcissist would tend to be contemptuous, defiant, 
contumacious against authority, uh, would tend to be reactant. So, you know, her trigger would tend to be reckless, uh, unaware of the consequences of his actions or feel himself immune to the consequences, etc., etc. would be a lot more psychopathic. And so the psychopathic narcissist or the malignant narcissist is the best of both worlds. <laughs> he has all the features of a narcissist and, and most of the features of a psychopath. But there is a major distinction between narcissists, psychopathic narcissists, covert narcissists, and a real factor one psychopath, a real psychopath. There, there are two major distinctions. Number one, the psychopath does not, does not need other people. The narcissist needs other people because he, he needs supply. He needs narcissistic supply. The narcissist recreates himself on the fly via the gaze of other people. He needs to be constantly seen in order to feel that he exists and in order to recreate his, his emulation of existence, his for existence. The, the psychopath doesn't need anyone, absolutely doesn't. The second distinction is that the, the narcissist is focused on one goal and one goal only, and that is narcissistic supply. The narcissist couldn't care less about anything else, only supply. Of course, if money, having money leads him, leads him on the path to obtaining more supply, he would be money hungry. But money is not the end, it's the means. The end is narcissistic supply. A psychopath is goal-oriented. A psychopath wants money for money's sake. He wants power for power's sake. He wants sex for sex's sake. He doesn't care about supply. He is not dependent on other people. You could say that the narcissist is a junkie, an addict of narcissistic supply, while the psychopath is a smooth operator. And this raises the issue whether there is such a thing as psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder, or whether that is merely a societal judgment, a, a culture-bound syndrome, not real, you know. It was a study by a, a, a pair of researchers called Moss and O'Connor uh, last year, which looked at the dark triad traits in political terms. And it found that people that were attracted to the, the far left, whatever you want to call it, the woke left, tended to be high in narcissism and Machiavellianism. And in contrast to that, people that were attracted to the the um, alt-right, as opposed to the, 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 the conservative right, the, the sort of radical right, if you like, uh, tended to be high in psychopathology. Um, and, of course, it distinguished these three terms. So narcissism, I could understand that, that oh, you get praised for being left-wing and whatever, and uh, a Machiavellianism, you get uh, you want power, and left-wing is a, is, a, is a means for power. But then you get some people that are so Machiavellian, I guess, that, that they can't, is it that they can't cope with any kind of power, and then they become so left-wing that they offend even the dominant left-wing society. How do, how, how do you think that these different dark triad traits uh, cross over them with, with, with why you'd be attracted to one kind of political perspective in one kind of society rather than another? Bradley, Bradley Campbell, who is a sociologist, suggested that we are transitioning from an age of dignity to an age of victimhood. Victimhood became the main determinant of identity in modern, modern life. Everyone and his dog is someone's victim, and if they're not, they will find a, victim, a victimizer or an abuser. So there are victims on the left, and there are victims on the right, and there are victimhood movements on the left, and victimhood movements on the, on the right. And I agree with you that the psychological profile of right-wing victims is different to the psychological profile of left-wing victims. When I say victims, I don't mean real victims. I mean victims, professional victims, career victims, <laughs> victimhood as a, as, a, as, a, as a job, you know, as a... So, Left-wing left -wing victims are essentially narcissistic. We have a series of studies that support this. I refer you to studies by Gabay, G-A-B-A-Y. I refer you to a recent study in 2020 published in British University of British Columbia and others. And these studies, recent studies, last two years, demonstrate pretty conclusively to my mind, one of these studies is, is with like uh, tens of thousands of people. I mean, they, they demonstrate pretty conclusively that there is an affinity between narcissism and psychopathy and left-wing activism, or at the very least, the posture 
of an eternal victim. The posture of, of victimhood as an identity. On the right, on the right side of the equation, we would find other psychopathological traits, but not necessarily narcissism and psychopathy. On the right side, we would find conspiracism. Conspiracism is a psychological proclivity to believe in conspiracy theories. We would find schizoid avoidant tendencies. These are people who want small government. They are, they are averse to intrusion and control. So they are very defiant, but they are defiant because they want to be left alone. They're not defined as a classical psychopath would be. A classical psychopath is defined because he wants to control. These people don't want to control anything. They just want to be left alone. And they are highly conspiracy-minded. But there isn't much sign or there aren't many signs of narcissism and psychopathy in the, in the right side. On the left side, there are. Psychopaths and narcissists consistently hijack left-wing victimhood movements and make render themselves themselves the public faces of these movements and and this is documented in the scholarly literature finally after so many years because there has been implicit self-censorship in academe i don't need to tell you mm. and people have been people have been penalized by losing tenure and jobs and what have you if they did speak against certain walk movements and and so on but this is changing I'm happy to see this is changing. What, what is what is the evidence that is changing? I mean, only this scholarly, only... This scholarly publication would have been impossible uh, ten years ago. Absolutely impossible. There would be no funding. There would be no uh, support by faculty. They they would. I mean, these people would have lost their tenure and their jobs and you name it. Ten years ago, it would have been utterly impossible. But now we have a mini yeah. mini tidal wave of studies that connect victimhood movements, grievances grievances and so on, connect them to dark triad um, features. Now, just to rectify one thing you have said, um, dark triad personalities are not narcissists and psychopaths. Dark, dark triad personalities are personalities uh, which are subclinical narcissists and subclinical psychopaths. In other words, they cannot be diagnosed with narcissism and psychopathy, but they have pronounced traits and behaviors that render them almost psychopaths or almost narcissists. Okay, but what wouldn't it? What wouldn't it be? I just, one thing that I struck me was that if you're if you're power hungry and you're you're narcissistic in a right wing society, uh, the, the the society of Victorian England, then wouldn't it follow that people like that would be attracted to okay. being very right wing and conservative in that context? And it would be the opposite. It would be these more psychopathic types that would be attracted to the danger of being left-wing in that context. Because it's almost as if you're implying that it's something inherent about left-wing uh, or uh, far-left movements that they are narcissistic. Uh, but but couldn't, wouldn't it be reversed in a very different kind of society? No, I, I don't think so. Actually, if you study the history of extreme right-wing politics, which you have, and but I'll, I'll just perhaps raise a few points, you see that the vast majority of uh, right-wing leaders who had become dictators emanated from the left. That would include Joseph Goebbels. It would include Mussolini. It would include Adolf Hitler, actually. <laughs> it would include many others. So the left is the breeding grounds for narcissists and psychopaths. They hone their skills, their political skills and other skills. And some of them migrate to the right opportunistically they migrate to the right and bring with them the baggage that they had acquired but the training and, and by the way i want to say something immediately i'm a leftist yeah. i'm a left winger well so, you would be because you're a psychopath so yes, i'm a left winger so an i'm not everything i'm saying is not because i'm a, a, a crazy alt-right steve bannon uh, uh, clone I'm I'm a I'm a left winger, so mm. I, I have <laughs> I have the kind of a, a, a stamp of objectivity on everything I'm saying, but I think the left, the extreme left, the alt left, if you wish, is breeding grounds for these people. Narcissists and psychopaths gravitate to this circle. But wouldn't it follow though? I'm slightly confused. Wouldn't it follow that? Okay, they they may well be breeding. They may well start off in this. I mean, I'm thinking an, an intense. Um, 
sense of unhappiness with with yourself, uh, and you and you kind of project this out onto the world, or the world's a terrible place. Uh, and I'm, I'm, how can I feel better about myself? I can sound more moral than other people. That's how I feel better. So I'm, I'm left wing. But on the other hand, if you if you gravitate towards being right wing when society is moving that way, uh, then uh, wouldn't it follow that you that there's something that opportunism is underpinned by a desire for praise, a desire for power, a desire for the these these dark triad uh, dimensions. Whenever society is moved to the extreme right, there were very powerful left left wing core concepts and elements embedded in the ostensible right. That's why it's you know national socialistic party. <laughs> The, the the agenda of the Nazi party, for example, included numerous numerous elements which were cannot be described as right wing by any by any extension of the of the phrase. So even right wing movements, when they take over or when they reflect the zeitgeist, they reflect the zeitgeist because of grievances, mass grievances. Yeah, yeah. So I guess we, we need to distinguish between the con the, the, the the conservatives, the or, and indeed even the extreme conservatives, and the, the radical right, and that the radical the radical right has these left wing dimensions. Um, yes. Uh, and and so it's the, it's uh, but what the, the question I guess is what would make somebody like um, Mussolini or Hitler. Uh, move from being a just out and out socialist to being a uh, a national socialist or fascist or whatever. And, you said uh, it. You said it. You said it yourself. Nationalism sells. It's a way to mobilize mobilize the the population. It's a mass mobilization tool. It's it's um, the confluence of of left wing with right wing is by far the most powerful winning combination. It's a it's an evolutionary adaptation of the first order. Whenever left-wing mindset and, and, and tactics colluded with right-wing sentiments, you got a winner. And, and Mussolini, as you well know, was a, a, a prominent left-winger. He was editor of a, of a left-wing, a communist paper. Um, Goebbels was a communist agitator and, and you know, but they have discovered the charms of nationalism in terms of mobilization. And so they have married the two. But the core ideology of Nazism is left wing, not right wing. It's certainly, I think, true that I mean, I've looked at this a lot and I looked at this particular study. A, a computer yeah. modeling has found that the group that dominates the other group in evolutionary terms is high in positive ethnocentrism and high in negative ethnocentrism. And a big element of nationalism is to say we're all the same yes so even if i think about F finland which i know a great deal about of course i live in finland you distinguish between the finland of just conservatism and the church and whatever where there was social class and the romantic nationalism the uh, the academic Karelia society all this where what they they go on and on about what well, doesn't matter whether you work by the sweat of your brow or by the the, the sweat of your you know your, your your brain or whatever. We're all Finns, and these bloody Russians are trying to destroy us and all this. I um, call it I call it malignant egalitarianism. I say that malignant egalitarianism is the underlying foundation, the organizing principle, the hermeneutic principle of the far left and the far right. And because malignant egalitarianism naturally gives rise to grievances. And because it is essentially a victimhood position, it's negative identity formation. You say, I am, I belong to this collective as opposed to the other. You need the other. You define yourself in contradistinction to the other. But it's, it is grievance based. Nazism was a grievance movement. It was a victimhood movement. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a yeah. victim of woman, and and it had enormous, I mean, a huge number of elements borrowed from socialism, including, by the way, all the tactics of the Communist Party. So, I, and I think the, the the reason we are kind of circling each other in this conversation is because we need to make a distinction, as, a distinction as you have made. I need to make a distinction. Sorry, it was my mistake between conservatism, 
conservatism and right-wing politics. They don't always go together. For example, the conservatives in Germany opposed Adolf Hitler until almost the last minute and even tried to assassinate him several times, including in 1944. So the conservatives didn't regard Adolf Hitler as a reification of conservatism in German society. Absolutely not. They regarded him as a revolutionary. They, he was indistinguishable in their minds from Lenin or Stalin, or he was just a, another pernicious or malignant manifestation of the revolutionary wave that swept Europe since 1848. And so... Conservatives, I don't know of any of any affinity between being conservative and being and having any psychopathology. I don't know of any correlation between psychopathology. Well, cert certainly the studies of which I, of course, there was this infamous study that was published in 2010, the Holtz et al., which found that psychoticism was higher among the right. And then they, six years later, they said there was a coding error after it had been reported in all the newspapers. That, oh, yeah, no, that is not a nonsense. Psychotic, yeah, I agree with but you. But that was, that they were saying conservatives are higher in conscientiousness, higher in agreeableness. Uh, yes. And these cross over with aspects of psychopathology. Um, so yeah, low among, among normal conservatives. Actually, psychot actually psychoticism is, is, um, is closely related to creativity. So creative types are much more high on on psychoticism. That is not me. That is that is Hans Eysenck. Eysenck, yeah. Eysenck. Eysenck proposed the trait of psychoticism, and he said that psychoticism leads inexorably to, to creativity. Now, is it an accident that most creative people are, are left wing? The, is it an accident? I don't no. think so. No, I think no, no. the yeah, there was a paper by, uh, what was his name, F um, Felix Post, uh, analysis right. of 291 great men. And he found that, that subclinical psychopathy, not psychopathy, but subclinical psychopathy, was massively overrepresented among his among his sample. I mean, it was unbelievable. And the yes. more creative they were, so the more artistic they were. So, yes, I haven't touched your 10 euros. I, I'm, I'm live streaming now. Uh, so my daughter wanted to know where her ten euros was, um, but um, but but uh, yes, so so uh, good. So, but one thing I noticed though, I mean, if we if we get back to the broader issue of of narcissism and psychopathy, um, is that when we were talking there, you were you 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 say that oh you you don't have a true self and you dealt with this by but you you conceded incorrectness. You said uh, oh well maybe I was wrong about this. I need to distinguish. You said between psychopathy uh, uh, between the the right the conservatives and the radical right. Um, so that that showed an element of humility. So do I do I interpret that as a false humility that you're just doing to try and impress me, or 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 do, would you say that um, people that are narcissists or psychopathic narcissists are are unstable in that that they they have periods where they're they're very narcissistic? No, no, no. They, they this have... has to do this has to do with conditioning. <laughs> I've I've simply spent most of my life. I went to I started I started my academic career at age nine. I was sent to university at age nine, so I was exposed to the rigors of academic training from age nine. And and this this tendency to hair split and nitpick, and be very precise and adhere to the truth. And you know, if you make a mistake, correct it immediately and and credit sources. And all these things have been drilled into my mind since age nine. There's nothing to do with my personality. It's simply I'm conditioned to do that, like a dog, you know, with the certain tricks. So you're, you're, so you're, you're, you're Pavlov's academic. You're, you're, yes. You're, yeah, you've, you've, in this you're, sense, in this sense. So if I if I catch myself making a mistake or something, I'll correct it immediately. And if I if I if I say something, I'll credit the source. These are academic habits. It's habit. It's a habit. It's not a reflection of any underlying personality construct or propensity. But, but what what about would you say the um the the idea that um we could suggest that our our personalities are not are not stable we are we we are different selves with with different people uh, a, a particular person that i have uh, has just sent in a super chat which i will answer in a minute and uh, he's extremely intelligent and also quite serious and i find myself with him being more serious i find i find the serious side of me comes out more when I'm dealing with a person who is quite serious. And then if I'm dealing with a person that's, that's more, uh, more more sort of laid back, 
uh, then I'm that, that side of me will, will come out more. Our, ourselves are, are are not sort of concrete in that way. And so, would would you say that with people that are narcissists, the, the, the self, the narcissistic or whatever element is or psychopathic is is fluid, or are there are, are there moments of epiphany when you realize, oh, I shouldn't have done that, uh, oh, that was silly, or 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 is it just all the time in, in this in this mode? If you know what I mean. Well, I wouldn't presume that you're acquainted with my work, but that has been that's my work over the last ten years. I'm I'm proposing to replace the paradigm of self in psychology with a paradigm of self states, self assembling, uh, repertory or theater troupe of self states. I say that people, healthy or not, have have a series of self states at their disposal. And that these self-states are triggered by the environment and they take over. Um, and the principle that governs the takeover is self-efficacy. If a self-state is more efficacious than another, then that self-state state will prevail and so on. So as the environment changes, people change self-states the way you change you know, your attire or clothing or whatever. And so I very, I'm very much in agreement with you, and that, that's the crux and the thrust of my academic work for the last 10 years. I believe the concept of self is wrong. I believe people are a river, not a pond. I believe people are in flux. I believe there is no such thing as a core. I think that the, the very concept of self as a rigid, immutable identity, lifespan, over the lifespan, is a reflection of the social mores of fin de siècle, fin de siècle end, of, end of the century Vienna. Don't forget that psycho psychology as a discipline is the outcome of German minds. Freud, <laughs> I'm not kidding, Freud, Jung, Wendt, others. They started psychology. They started off psychology. Breuer, Bleuler, I mean, they're all Germans. Germans Jewish. Is one of them is, at least one of them is Jewish. Jewish, Jewish German. Is it, the is it the outcome of Jewish minds? No, German minds. German minds. It was the German side of Freud that, that prevailed in, in his psychology. Now, at that time, everything was rigid. There was a rigid, rigid potentate. There was a rigid dictator, in effect, a king or an emperor. Everything was hierarchical. Everything was structured. Everything was immutable. Everyone believed that empires would last forever. And this was reflected in the psychology, in the psychological theories that, that prevailed at the time. And so we, we inherited the concept of self from Freud and, and even more so from Jung. It's, 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 but it's counterfactual. It's nonsense. Anyone who is working, I work with people. I give, I give counseling to people. I mean, this is the concept of self is utterly useless and also wrong in in treating people in helping people so i agree with you that we we fluctuate we're in flux um, what, what, what about what about the idea that uh, one thing i i personally notice is that um my daughter will be 14 years old soon and i find that interesting because when i think back to myself at 14 I kind of see myself as the same as I am now, same kind of personality. I was when I was younger than that. I was more shy, more introverted. I think, uh, for example, and um, it's something like, yeah, that's me. Fourteen, thirteen, I'm not so sure, and twelve, perhaps not. And there is a the correlation between personality at eighteen and personality at eight is something like 0. 0.6. And to the extent that your personality is your way of being, is is yourself. Then this is consistent, yeah. On the one hand, with the idea yeah, it's in flux and it's it's difficult to pin down. But on the other hand, that there is some sort of core, um, particularly perhaps by adolescence, that that, that that short of some brain injury that radically changes you, um, is although it changes and moves, is is you. What, what do you think of that? I dispute this. I dispute this. I think there are behaviors that persist for lengthy periods of time never never for the entire lifespan by the way but for lengthy periods of time there are behaviors that persist 
they are immutable. They are, they are characteristics that appear to be immutable, and they are, and we create narratives that convince us of continuity. We need to believe in continuity, otherwise we'll fall apart. So we self-deceive into continuity. We we create we create these organizing principles, these narratives, these scripts, which convince us somehow that we are the same person from one day to the next, let alone from one year to the next. But I think if you were to shine a bright light on all this, you would see that most of these claims are counterfactual. But could it be suggested that some people, I mean, that's the, um, when I was uh, speaking to your, uh, your, your friend Richard on here, and the way he uh, summarized it is by saying that, that narcissists or, uh, and so on, they, they lack a, they have a fragile self, they lack a clear sense of self. So could it be that although the, the self is nebulous, as you say, and is in flux, with some people it is more in flux than others? Yes, some people have more, a bigger, a higher number, or bigger number of self-states than others. And the regulation of the self-states um, is less, less uh, stringent, less rigorous, and less coherent. And that is a great definition of mental illness. <laughs> so therefore, some people, in a sense although none of us have a clear self across time, some people have more of a self than others. Some people have a more, more tight algorithm as to which self-states, which self-state will take over it with, with at any given environment. And some people are less, have a, a lessened, lessened self-control. And so they, the self-states are a bit more chaotic. They are less, less predictable. And they are much less self-efficacious because very often these people get the wrong self-state to react to the environment. So there's a mismatch between the self-state and the environment and self-efficacy declines. So it's the algorithm and, 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 and we can compromise, you and me, you and I, we can compromise and say that this algorithm is what you call a self, okay? Mm -hmm. There's an algorithm that regulates the appearance, functioning and recession or remission of the self-states. When this algorithm is disrupted, when it's counterfactual, for example, it's delusional, when it's when it's when reality testing is impaired, then the algorithm will malfunction. And the pairing of self-states with the environment, with the, with the changing environments, exigencies, demands, other people, this pairing would be impaired as well. And then you will have mental illness. Right, but uh, for example, um, you, 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 uh, I, I, well, all right, yes, okay, fair enough. Uh, but, uh, moving on to a slightly different issue, um, what would you, the, the, the concept of narcissism has become very, very popular over the last sort of 10 to 15 years, uh, as has autism. Uh, and, and various other uh, sort of psychological ide ideas. That, that uh, why do you think narcissism, in particular, which is your area, and increasingly borderline personality as well, um, has become popularized to to the extent that it has in the, over the last sort of ten or fifteen years? Because narcissism had become a positive adaptation rather than a negative one. In, in up until the nineteen sixties, shall we say? Narcissism was a negative adaptation. If you were a narcissist, you suffered. You made less money, you were not promoted, you couldn't get a wife, you couldn't establish a family, etc., etc., because you were an a-hole, a jerk, and no one would come near you. And people would shun you and so on, because there was a collectivist mindset. Even in the United States, there was a collectivist mindset. The Victorian throwback, you know. The Victorian age lasted until the 1960s. It didn't end with Victoria. So there was this collectivist thing, very Japanese. <laughs> and so you didn't, if you didn't fit in, if you stood out because you were a narcissist, you suffered. And then starting in the 1960s, and definitely when the new technologies were introduced in the 1990s, internet, later on social media, et cetera, et cetera, narcissism became a positive adaptation. Today, if you're a narcissist, you're rewarded. You're much more self-efficacious you're much more likely to accomplish things and end up in high positions. You're, you're much more likely, you, you have a higher reproductive success. So narcissism pays like crime, you know, it pays. 
And so we now glorify narcissism. We don't realize it, but we are, we are glorifying narcissism. And we're beginning to glorify psychopathy, actually. And, and that's why we have today um, the concepts of high-functioning narcissists or high-functioning psychopaths, you know, because we are beginning to believe, and, and there's um, your namesake, Dutton, Kevin Dutton, he has written a series of books about how great it is to be a psychopath and a narcissist and how society needs psychopaths and narcissists and how we are very lucky to have them because they they safeguard us and they're the next stage in evolution. But hasn't it always, if you look at uh, the research by uh, Dean K. Simonton and people like this that have done historionic analyses of people, uh, right. then hasn't it always been the case that the, the charismatic type or whatever that, that rises to the top, even in the collectivist society, will be, uh, and Kevin Dutton does look at this historically, uh, will tend to have this optimum combination of high intelligence and basically psychopathic traits. And similarly, if you look at uh, what we mentioned earlier, Felix Post, I wish he was still alive, I could interview him, but alas, he is dead. Um, um, uh, the same thing, that historically, it is someone like Napoleon, let's say, okay, he didn't have any children, but I, I right, but, but it was surely a highly intelligent psychopath. Um, and, the, uh, and, and similar people of that, of that ilk, so there's always been a success attached to having that optimum combination of intelligence and psychopathology. It's not just or, and, or intelligence and narcissism. It's not just a modern thing. It is a modern time in this in this in the sense of attribution. While past narcissists and past psychopaths would anchor their grandiosity in the collective, modern narcissists and psychopaths uh, attribute. The grandiosity to themselves. So, sorry, typical, can, I, can, I, can I? Sorry, what, what do you mean? Anchor their their grandiosity. I, I will try to explain. I try to explain. You go to Japan. You you come across narcissists. Narcissism is a biological phenomenon. It's it's common. It's, it's a human species thing. It's an artifact of the complexity of human psychology. So you go to Japan. You come across narcissists. But the narcissists in Japan would brag, would boast. Uh, and, but would anchor his grandiosity in his uh, social and corporate frameworks. So a typical narcissist in Japan would tell you, my company, the company I work for, is great. It's the best in the world. My family is, is distinguished. My country is unique. My culture is amazing. He, he, he wouldn't say, I'm a genius, you know, I'm talented, as an American would. So collective narcissism, the locus of grandiosity is crucial. Collect, uh, narcissism expressed in collective societies is grounded in the collective. Narcissism expressed in individualistic societies is grounded in the individual. An American would tell you I'm a genius. A Japanese would tell you I work for Toyota, the greatest manufacturers of cars ever. And that's, that's where he would derive his grandiosity from. His claim to fame would be that he's Japanese and works for Toyota. And the claim to fame but of don't, but don't individualistic narcissists all I mean Donald they wouldn't they also boast about having been to highly prestigious institutions and and uh, in that, but they in that would sense. always but they would always attribute it to themselves. They would say, I was invited to the White House, I've been invited to the White House because I'm a great singer, or because I'm a genius, or because I'm a war hero. They would revert to themselves. The claim would revert. The claim would never end at having been invited to the White House or having or being an American. But the claim would always revert. Now, wh why is this wrong? Why is it a problem? It's a problem because it is exclusionary. The narcissist needs to escalate his claims. So if the narcissist is in, an individualistic person and his claim to fame or his grandiosity reside in his individuality, he has to exclude and denigrate and deprecate and devalue everyone around him in order to stand out, which the Japanese narcissist doesn't have to do. I see. In other words, in other words the, the Japanese narcissism, Japanese narcissism is pro-social. Is communal. American narcissism is individualistic. 
and therefore dangerous because it undermines the fabric of society. It's it's adversarial, it's competitive. What do you think that uh, the, the rise of social media and so forth, um, to what extent is that a reflection of narcissism in society and to what extent does, is it, does it make that worse? Social media are American phenomena. They've been invented by Americans. And not only have they been invented by Americans, they've been invented utterly, I mean, totally, by young, schizoid, white men. End of story. There hasn't been a single black man there or woman. There hasn't been uh, someone who has been socially adept. There have been, has been anyone above the age of 25. So it's, it's a manifestation and projection of a specific demography, demographic. And it reflects the psychology of this cohort, of this population. And so social media had two, I think, two impacts has two impacts. One, it brings it, it brings narcissists and psychopaths out of the woodwork. The social media is a, is a playing pen, a, a perfect space within which to, you know, elicit supply, within which to pre prey on people, and so on. So it's a great playground, and it attracts narcissists and psychopaths. They gravitate to social media. And the second thing, it fosters a narcissistic style Lance Perry, who's a psychologist, suggested the distinction between narcissistic style and narcissistic personality disorder. He said that many people have narcissistic style, but it doesn't make, make them narcissists. What social media do, do they encourage, encourage and enhance and reward narcissistic behaviors and traits that are subclinical. They don't amount to narcissistic personality disorder, but they are narcissistic in they are ostentatious exhibitionistic grandiose entitled etc etc that's the situation yeah yes um and, and they they also encourage these pylons by by what i would see as vulnerable narcissists or what we would see as i.e the the far left activists who are who moralize uh, as, a, as a means of avoiding dealing with their own personal uh, uh, problems. They encourage that. It, it makes it so much easier to shut someone down. Far right activists have their own share of uh, of misuse of social media. I don't think social media is partial to anyone's convictions or prejudices. So far, far the far left um, has leveraged technologies such as radio, not only not only social media, to you know aggressively and sometimes violently against other people. So I wouldn't be too quick to judge. Um, but yes, of course, each of these parties makes use of the technology to, to enhance certain path psychopathological traits. Technology in general brings out, amplifies us. What is technology? Technology is an extension of us. From the earliest days, 600,000 years ago, when technology started, it was an extension of human faculties, human attributes, the hand, mind, so social media is just an extension of, of, but I think social media is a departure from all other classical technologies because it's about escaping reality, not about coping with reality, and because it enhances strictly psychopathologies, not psychology. If you wish, I will explain what I just said. Yes, do. 600,000 years ago, we were primates. We were primates and we started to use technology. But we started to use technology 600,000 years ago in order to extend our bodies and our minds. The stick, the arrowhead, they were all extensions of the hand. You know, later on, painting and writing, they were extensions of the mind. We were extending ourselves, expanding outwards, if you wish, using technology. In the 1990s, there was a major departure from this. Technology was no longer about extending ourselves towards reality, but technology became about extending ourselves inwards, away from reality, escaping, evading, and avoiding reality. The metaverse is a perfect example of this. The metaverse would detach us completely from reality, would divorce us from reality. 
the idea is to avoid an escape reality. It's it's a new thing in technology. That that's the first thing. The second thing, all previous technologies brought brought out the best in us. Previous technologies brought out um, characteristics which were good in essence. They amplified us. They made us more e- efficient. More. They made us more. Social media bring out our psychopathologies, our deficiencies, our inadequacies, our fears, our aggression. Our... So social, social media are the first technologies to bring out the worst in us, not the best in us. And it, that's a generalization. And of course, there are exceptions. But numerous studies, including studies by Facebook itself, substantiate what I'm saying. Social media amplified the worst aspects of us. All previous technologies did the opposite. Social media is about escaping reality. All other technologies were about confronting reality and fitting into reality and leveraging reality. Okay, well, we're about halfway through. So if you're new to the Jolly Heretic, I'd just like to say hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Jolly Heretic. We are an online public house uh, that... uh, discusses based science and based research of all kinds that is increasingly expunged from our woke joke universities. Uh, Normally on Mondays, I'm here uh, answering your various interesting questions, which I research. And on Thursdays, I have a a hopefully based and interesting guest. And I have one today in the form of Professor Sam Vaknin, who is an expert psychologist and who is an expert on narcissism. So if you have any questions for him, then do send them in on the link is on the screen or on YouTube if you want. And we would, of course, um, answer them today. Uh, Please subscribe. It really helps if you do that. Uh, If you want to help the show, you can see ways to do so in the description below. And also, why not buy a a Jolly Heretic mug or a T-shirt? See how to do so in the descriptions below. Okay, um, we have a number of questions. So first of all, then, from uh, Mary Ann Kent. Uh, no, this is no, that, that's got, that's not it. Here we go. Sorry, Mark Zia. Mr. Vaknin, in the documentary I Psychopath, you claimed to have been diagnosed with psychopathy. Mark Zia. Uh, uh, Mr. Vaknin, in the documentary I Psychopath, you claimed to have been diagnosed. Oh my God. What's sorry, I accidentally, I accidentally unmuted myself. That's what I did. Okay, sorry. Uh, so in the in the um, in the doctor in the I, I psychopath, you claim to have been diagnosed with psychopathy. Are you still so afflicted? And what would you do to your host today if you could do so, if you could do as you would? I don't know. If I'm still diagnosed, I have to be diagnosed <laughs> to answer this question. I haven't been diagnosed with psychopathy, strictly speaking. The cutoff, the cutoff for the PCL test, PCLR test, which was used in the documentary, is 30, 30, and I scored 18. So I'm a subclinical psychopath. Um, that is very typical of psychopathic narcissism. The psychopathic element in psychopathic narcissism is subclinical, is not full fledged, not fully expressed. Whether I'm still a subclinical psychopath, I venture a guess that I am. This is a lifelong condition. It doesn't just vanish. Although, as people grow older, as psychopaths grow older, the psychopathy ameliorates in the sense that they no longer engage in antisocial behaviors. So behaviorally, psychopathy mitigates and sometimes disappears altogether. Very similar to borderline. There's a spontaneous remission behaviorally, but not psychodynamically, not psychologically. So so I I, I can understand why why psychopathy reduces because agreeableness goes up with age, conscientiousness goes up with age, and you're more conditioned with age. But why why would borderline reduce? We're not quite sure. We think it's a brain abnormality to start with, and somehow the brain fixes itself. We don't have an answer to this. But we do know that 81% of people with borderline personality disorder lose the diagnosis by by age 45. So it's a, it's a giant, enormous remission, enormous uh, remission rate. And it seems to indicate that the disorder somehow is biological because even people who don't, don't go to therapy, who don't attend any, any kind of forum or treatment or whatever, they remit. I see. That's very interesting. OK, Mark Sear also says, Mr. Vagnin, you diagnosed Trump with narcissistic personality disorder prior to his election. Can you give us an update on his progression? I didn't diagnose him in 2016 when he himself hadn't declared yet that he is a candidate. Before he declared himself to be a candidate, 
I gave an interview to an American thinker, I think, which is a, a kind of conservative or alt, alt-right website or something. And I said that I think he would he will declare himself candidate and I think he would win the elections, actually. That's what I said in the interview. And I said that I think he has all the hallmarks of, um, of a malignant narcissist or a psychopathic narcissist. And I warned against the cons- possible consequences of him being elected. But I made very, I tried to make very clear in the interview that I haven't met him, I haven't interviewed him, I haven't tested him, and that everything I say should be taken with a mountain of salt. It's possible that I'm wrong. Um, if I had to, if I had to do it again, I would say yes. He still conforms to type. Okay. Uh, well, uh, the next question is also from Marx here. He says, Mr. Vaknin, twin studies suggest a high heritability for cluster B personality disorders. What do you think is the evolutionary strategy behind these personality disorders? Twins, twin studies show a high heritability of antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorder, not of narcissistic personality disorder. So we tend to believe that psychopathy antisocial personality disorder and borderline personality disorder do have a genetic a genetic factor or a genetic determinant, but not narcissistic personality disorder. What would be the, the strategy? Well, according to Dutton and others, psychopathy, psychopaths are great leaders. They are great innovators and entrepreneurs. They that's, And that's because they are reckless. They, they are, in other words, brave and courageous. They take on the world. Borderline is a much more convoluted, much more convoluted question. Uh, the first of all, the underlying assumption that everything has a, an evolutionary reason, and that if there's something in in the human species, it must it must be a positive adaptation, is absolutely wrong. According to evolutionary theory, it is possible to have numerous negative adaptations and mutations, which are detrimental to the species. And I would venture to suggest that borderline personality disorder is exactly such a negative adaptation, a mutation, which is detrimental and deleterious to the species. Wouldn't that imply then that uh, it it would have, as Darwinian selection pressures have decreased over the last 200 years, that we would see it, it would be something that would be less discussed or things like it would be less discussed. Uh, I don't know about be, being discussed. You know, but... I mean, like, they'd be less. You can look at you can look at sort of Shakespeare plays, and you can say to yourself, okay, that character is kind of narcissistic or whatever. Wouldn't it imply that you you'd have very few borderline people? It would be. We have no phenomenon. data. We have no. We have no comparative data. We we don't know the the prevalence and incidence of borderline in the 17th century. So. I'm, I'm unable to answer this. I mean, people have suggested, for example, that schizophrenia, that, that nothing like it, nothing, no descriptions of anything like it have existed until relatively recently. There's some people that have argued this. Oh, no, I would tend to dispute this. I think schizophrenia paranoia probably is the diagnosis that would have fitted Jesus Christ and uh, many other prophets. They were psychotic by any definition of the word. <laughs> they were grandiose psychotics. Which is a sub variant of psychosis, but they, they suffered from psychosis. So schizophrenia is a bad example, but borderline is a is a good example because we don't we we don't have good descriptions of borderline like behaviors in past in the past. I know there's a description of Richard the Third, um, and them talking about him getting incredibly him getting incredibly angry and his eyes sort of changing, and then him coming out leaving the room and then coming back in in a completely different state, almost as a different person, and having a load of people executed. There, there is that. That's a description. That is Shakespeare. That is Shakespeare. No, no, no. It's not Shakespeare. That's not Shakespeare. No, that's that's a, that's a historical um, description of the time. Okay. Actually, the next yeah. Actually, Josephine Tay, you know, in her famous book about the uh, the daughter of time, she studied Richard the Third, and she she published her the the kind of historical research that she has made, and it seems to be that he was far more benevolent and benign than than given credit for. Don't forget the cultural and societal context. They're very critical in any any diagnosis of psychopathology. Many things that we consider psychopathological to, today were not considered psychopathological at the time. 
And many things were, were considered psychopathological. For example, homosexuality until 1973 was a diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. The DSM described homosexuality as a mental illness until 1973. So we have a kaleidoscopic view of psychopathology. And we tend to ignore societal and cultural dimensions because the DSM and psychology in general thrive in individualistic societies like the United States and Canada. But psychology is, is embedded in a context as, as the object relations school in the United Kingdom realized in the 60s. Psychology is about interacting with other people. Okay, Mark Seal says, Mr. Vacton, is there a correlation between extreme personality traits and personality, extreme personality traits, I guess he means on the big five, and personality disorders? By definition, the factor five, the factor five test, or the factor five model of personality, describes personality disorders as a radical version of some of these traits and behaviors or a negation of some of these traits of behaviors. So, for example, psychopathy is described as a lack of conscientiousness and agreeableness. So, uh, I don't quite understand the question. Yeah, yeah, that's, I think that's that's a fair point. Okay, yeah. um, what's the next question? Uh, doctrine, uh, 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 no, did that one, did that one, did that one. Uh, doctrine says, um, do, uh, do Jews have high levels of narcissism since they believe themselves to be God's chosen people with a duty to heal the world? but also to be ethereal victims, which all Gentiles must recognize, says Doctrine. I think the history of the Jewish people, and especially the recent traumatic event of the Holocaust, has engendered narcissistic defenses in them, including, of course, victimhood as, as an eternal state or beneficial state. And so, yes, the Jews today probably would be much more narcissistic than the general population and than the Jews in the 19th century or 17th century. In other words, it's not something something genetic or historical. It's not something, I'm sorry, genetic or biological. It's something which is reactive to environment and history. The Jews have been victimized. That's not imagination or delusion. They've been victimized throughout the ages. And so, like... All other victims we're, we're acquainted with, they react with complex trauma, CPTSD, and complex trauma or complex post-traumatic stress disorder includes this, this diagnosis, this mental state, includes strong elements of narcissism and even psychopathy. So today, people who have been traumatized in an, in an intimate relationship People who've been exposed to domestic violence, narcissistic abuse, they emerge from the relationship with the diagnosis of CPTSD, complex trauma, but they display overt and clear behaviors which are typical of narcissists and psychopaths. And these are defensive behaviors. So the Jews are the same. They have been subjected to long-term trauma. And so they're traumatized. They're in a post-traumatic state and so they display narcissistic and psychopathic behaviors on, I think, a higher level than the general population. In so much as schizophrenia is associated with stress, uh, would, uh, would, would, would that also, because there's evidence that that is high, among, higher among uh, Ashkenazi Jewish samples than among uh, uh, the rest, uh, would, would that be consistent with uh, uh, you know, this, this sort of post-Holocaust trauma? I'm not aware of any association between schizophrenia and stress. Schizophrenia is supposedly a biological condition, a biochemical condition, uh, a brain condition. That's why we treat schizophrenia with antipsychotics. Um, stress can exacerbate certain behavioral manifestations of schizophrenia, but not the, schizoph not the underlying condition itself. It doesn't create the condition. It doesn't change the condition. The condition is there. Okay, someone in the chat has just diagnosed me with maxillary hyperplasia. So thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you for that diagnosis. I'm very grateful um, to you. I'm sure you're a trained doctor and you know exactly what you're talking about. And uh, I shall, uh, I shall take that on the. I'll take, I shall keep that in mind. Um, okay, the next question comes from 
um, uh, 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 Oraz. Uh, sorry, no, from uh, uh, yes, Oraz. And he says, yeah, This uh, guy diagnosed you or me? Yeah, yeah, he just said in the chat, that I have maxillary hyperplasia. Okay, um, SV, uh, masculinity studies uh, is one of the most underhanded and insidious rhetorical institutional constructs for me. There is zero resolute criticism and widespread acceptance. Are people tolerant of underhandedness using a benevolent premise or on behalf of women? Apart from a few, there is unanimous rationalizing to defend it. Uh, do you follow that question? Yeah, I think I do. Mm -hmm. Men have spent millennia um, suppressing and objectifying and in extreme cases torturing and mutilating women or at the very least regarding women as property and leveraging the reproductive assets of women and so on and so forth. There has been an asymmetry of power between men and women which started in the agricultural revolution, probably beforehand it was more balanced. But ever since the agricultural revolution, clearly men have been on top in every possible sense and have been abusing, abusing their position. And this has lasted for five, maybe seven, maybe 10,000 years. There's a debate, a very big debate. And then women in the past 150 years have righted the balance to some extent. They've acquired new powers and new access and new privileges. And women have reacted as any enslaved minority has reacted in, 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 the, in the past, had reacted in the past. Women had reacted with rage. Women had reacted with aggression. Women had reacted with narcissism. Women had reacted with, not, with psychopathic behaviors. Women became defiant. Women became disempathic. This is very typical of suppressed minorities when they, when they gain their freedom or when they gain equality with the erstwhile, with the erstwhile abusers or erstwhile suppressors. Toxic masculinity is the reaction of a small minority of men, small minority of men, to this resurgence or surge or in insurgency of, of narcissism and psychopathy among women. And so there is a war, there's a war between the genders. And this war is toxic on both sides. But to, to characterize the totality of the male subspecies as toxic and to impute and attribute toxic masculinity to every single living, penis-carrying person is, of course, counterfactual, ideological, and wrong, ethically and otherwise. And yet, I agree with you that many gender studies programs and so on do exactly this the problem is that we have swapped we have swapped intellectual endeavor with ideology ideology has invaded our higher education institutions and has taken over and ideology is is never right ideology just is it's a power play it's just a power play. It codifies, it codifies the power play, codifies the conflict. Ideology is about conflict because it's always exclusionary. Now, both yes. sides are engaged in a war. Both of them engage in war. And like in, the, like in conservatism, there is conservatism and there is alt-right. Similarly, among men, there, is, there are men and then there is the manosphere. The manosphere is as toxic as radical third wave and maybe fourth wave feminism is. These are both manifestations of radicalization and the destruction of the fabric of intergender collaboration and the charm of being together with the opposite sex. Okay. I, the, sorry. I, yes. I am very, it, this is something that exercises me a lot. This is a hot button topic for me. 
is I think, honestly, climate change is a really dangerous and frightening thing, but we are going to adapt to it. We're going to move our cities inland. We're going to somehow survive. We have survived the transition from trees to savanna. We're going to survive climate change. But we will not survive as a species if we don't immediately address the war between men and women. We will not. This is the real crisis, the number one crisis, far more dangerous than climate change. Okay, thank you. KG says morning. Thank you very much indeed, sir. Thank you for your donation. Uh, ID, ideas sleep furiously. It says, question for Sam on gifted children. You've said the most important thing is not to remove them from peers, but to accelerate them. Why? Gifted schools are often great and rare places for socialization. Gifted schools are okay because the, the, the gifted child is moved, among, moved to be among his peers in a gifted school. But what they did to me, for example, was very not okay. I was nine years old. I was tested. I scored 185 on an IQ test, which, by the way, is a meaningless number. And then much later in life, I scored 190 and 180 again. So probably it's a stable number. But I scored 185 as a child. And then I was removed from my peers. And I was, I was sent to a university where everyone around me was 21 to 24 years old. Because in Israel, people have to serve in the army. And they start academic studies at age 21. So I was nine. Everyone around me was 21 and 24. And that's how I spent my childhood and adolescence until age 17. That was wrong. That was seriously wrong. I didn't acquire the most basic skills. I don't know, flirting with a girl, uh, hobnobbing with my, with my male peers, bromances. I, I didn't acquire any of this. I'm utterly clueless as to how to behave with other people because I wasn't given the chance at socialization, enculturation, acculturation. You know, I wasn't given the chance. We know in psychology that peers, peers are much more important than parents starting age, at age 9 or 10. Starting at age 9 or 10, people pay much more, and um, children pay much more attention to their peers. All the, the important processes, sex education, social interactions, reading social cues, reading sexual cues, adaptation, negotiation, compromise, collaboration, all of them are peer acquired. They are acquired through peer interactions. You take the child away from the peer group, you create an invalid, you create a crippled person, which I am. Are you? So how, how long uh, How long before, how old were you when you feel that you could start su uh, successfully hobnobbing with, with girls? Never. You've never successfully hobnobbed with girls? You can't, you can't, re you can't recoup this lost period. And during what this else? Loss, what, how else is it manifested? Do you, do you think this this loss? I'm a period? misfit. When it comes to other human beings, I'm a misfit in every possible mm. sense. It's like they had created an, an artificial, artificial autistic person. Ah, in, yeah, it's okay. So, but for example, for you. example, with this with this interview, I said to you, "Can we do it in the evening?" And you said, "No, no, absolutely not. No, no. My office hours are until five o'clock. That's it." Uh, no negotiation. Now, you may have had things you do in the evening, and that's fair enough. Or, or is it that you feel that you're just quite rigid and you like having certain times where you do certain things, and that's that? I'm rigid. It's part, it's part of my grandiosity. Who will prevail? It's a power play. All right, but so I was I'm fighting you to make you come on the Jolly Heretic in the evening, and you were like, no, 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 that's not, that's not happening. Yeah, then, <laughs> then would have been surrender. Then would have been <laughs> narcissistic injury. But I'm also, in addition to that, I'm also clueless when it comes to human interactions of all kinds, not only courting girls or flirting with girls, with women. I'm utterly clueless. And I, I observe people and I read textbooks in order to, to understand or to inculcate in me the capacity to interact with people. But it's secondhand and it's artificial and it's perceived very often as fake. 
didn't you have older sisters, older brothers, people like this from whom you could I had learn? younger, younger brothers, three of them, and a younger sister. And I was forced to raise all of them because my parents were both mentally ill. So I was forced to raise my siblings on my own. I was parentified. So I became simultaneously an adult when it came to the parent roles. I became a parent to my siblings. And at the same time, I became a student the university at age nine. I, I never had a childhood or an adolescent. And is there is there research on what parentification, if that's the term, oh, does yeah, to psychology? Quite a lot. It's quite what, does a lot of... what does it do? It it makes you feel inadequate to summarize it. I have a, a series of videos on my channel with regards to parentification, where I go into great detail as to psychological effects. But in a nutshell. It makes you feel that you have to serve other people and that you're never doing you you never you're never good enough you're never doing as much as you should so you become a people pleaser and you become subservient to other people and mm. you, you feel you have this feeling knowing feeling that you should serve others that's the purpose of that's your raison d'etre that's the purpose for your existence you know? interesting okay jolly good okay the next question comes from uh, Peter Philo Filipovic, and he says, I suggest to Sam to read the article entitled On the Psychology of the Conspiracy Denier by Tim Foyle. Okay, I'll have a look at that as well. Um, but but the thing is that when we say, a, when, when we talk about a conspiracy, I, I should emphasize that what I mean when I talk about a conspiracy theory is that it's unnecessary. It's unnecessary to explain the data that, it, that it, it's a conspiracy theory if you impute a conspiracy where it could just as easily be explained by a cock up or by or, or, or by natural organic processes and that's what things like the moon land and and also that it, you wouldn't get away with it things like the moon landing a lot of people on my who are watch my show say the moon landing was faked right how many there's always the possibility of this leaking how many thousands of people would have to keep their mouth shut for this not to leak so i that's my um that's my issue with the parsimony of a lot of these these conspiracy theories uh okay the next question comes from uh Mac Machiavelli sucks to go and he says i can i convinced I mean, I, that swms i don't know what that means are the least narcissistic on the planet uh, um okay do, do you know what swms are not really. Let me look it up for a minute. Yeah, I don't know. I, I do wish people would not use acronyms because it just yes, causes problems. A good idea. SWMs. Oh, it's, I think straight straight white males. Oh, right. Okay. 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 Straight. Can you repeat the question now? With, so with he our... says, I am convinced that straight white males are the least narcissistic on the planet. I'm sorry, but that defies the the <laughs> defies statistics. Statistically, straight white males are the predominant figure uh, in the cohort, in the population that is diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. To the extent that in previous editions of the DSM, they said that 75% of people with narcissistic personality disorder are men. And they meant straight white men because black men, they don't go to therapy. They're not diagnosed. Because they avoid therapy and, and so on. The vast majority of men who go to therapy are actually white. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from uh, I am a stupid moron. And he says, Has the professor read any Kevin MacDonald? I'm not quite sure what he's referring to. He's asking, Have you read any books by the psychologist Kevin MacDonald? I have. So, what's what the question? I, I guess he wonders what you think of his research. I don't know. I think I would appreciate a, a more specific question. <laughs> okay, well, never mind. Um, let's try and find a more specific question from Carla Rete, and, and she said, he or she says, um, is there any correlation between very high intelligence and one creativity to emotional instability? We don't have data that, that we don't have data that supports such a correlation. Very high intelligence. There's also a debate as what, what constitutes intelligence, as you well know. IQ is a measure of a highly specific type of intelligence known as analytical intelligence, and to some extent, spatial, spatial intelligence, space. But IQ measures maybe 
of, of intelligence, as Gardner and others have, have noted. So even if we adopt IQ as the measure, IQ is not correlated with emotional instability or, or creativity. Psychoticism is correlated with creativity. Well, I think said that that above a certain level of IQ, mm -hmm. uh, 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 intelligence doesn't matter to creativity. But there has to be a certain level of intelligence. I think he, he estimated. We it don't have any. We don't have studies that support this. I mean, I'm not well, aware. I, I, the the research by Simonton and so forth on highly creative people seems to indicate they're all rather intelligent. Uh, so I think I, I suspect that it does, uh, but and also the the creativity scale yeah. uh, correlates quite strongly with intelligence. Um, I'm not aware of any studies that correlate intelligence and creativity. Symington wrote Symington's writings are more broad. He was not an a, a, you know an experimentalist, and so. But as for emotional instability, no, I'm not aware of any correlation between. No, there's no, uh, no correlation. There is. It's probably it's probably very very small. Well done. I think I think it has to do it has to do with the romantic idea that a creative person is both intelligent and insane, like in, yeah. in romanticism or in, in the idealistic period, especially in Germany in the 19th century, there was this romantic genius crazy guy like Nietzsche. You know, is is intelligent, is romantic, is creative, is is crazy. So the the linkage between between insanity, um, intelligence. And creativity is extremely dubious. <laughs> we don't have any. There's certainly there's some evidence that, that, that in that among geniuses of the kind that were looked at by Felix Post, I've mentioned a number of times that quite a few of them were basically mentally ill. So maybe at extreme levels of creativity, but I don't know about sort of more generally. Um, next question comes from uh, five thousand and two seven, who says, "Why are narcissism and BPD so prevalent? Many of those in power exhibit these traits. Did we select for it?" I think we've looked at that essentially, uh, 5,027. We've looked at the selection pressures on that already, uh, if you refer to earlier. Um, uh, BS says, does your guest know... No, I'm not going to ask questions like that. Uh, okay, let's go, let's, let's go back to 5,002. I, um, just because a, a person that I have on the Jolly Heretic is Jewish doesn't mean we have to direct questions about the Holocaust uh, at him. All right, um, so... Um, um, uh, why do you think the question the person's asking, 5,027, why, why is BPD so prevalent these days? I don't know that it's pre so prevalent these days. We we started measuring prevalence and incidence um, more or less forty years ago. So that's hardly <laughs> hardly something to go on. You should ask me this question in two hundred years. I'd be better equipped to to respond. So yes. we we don't see over the last forty years we see an increase in narcissism. That's true. Studies by Twenge, Jean Twenge and Campbell, Keith Campbell demonstrated that there's a, a general rise in narcissistic traits and narcissistic style, especially among college students. Jean Twenge ran a study 40 years, for 40 years, 40 years running, on 1 million, on 1 million people. So probably the largest study ever carried out. And she demonstrated a rise in narcissism among these people and a shift in values. Uh, People in these studies were mostly college students between the ages of, of 18 and 25. And in the 80s, they valued knowledge, learning, and traditional values. And then in, the, in 2012, which was the last time this study was run, was conducted, people valued fame, or actually number one, money, number two, fame and celebrity. So the old values in the 1980s disappeared altogether. People didn't value knowledge anymore. They didn't, all the traditional values in the 1980s have vanished 40 years later. That's, a, that's the biggest study we have. And this is, I mean, this is what, what Sir John Glubb, I don't know if you've read Sir John Glubb's book on the fate of empires. And yes. what he notes is that always in the winter of civilization, in the autumn of civilization, the heroes are scientists and soldiers and religious men. But in the, uh, the winter, it's always the same. It's pop stars, singers, actors. It's football, famous football players and so on. celebrities, and and yeah. that, and that's a fascinating that shift happened so quickly in just forty years. But I guess when I was I was born in nineteen eighty, 
And when I was at school, there you didn't have kids. Kids now, what do you want to do for a job? They say, I want to be a YouTube star. That's what they say. Uh, and it, it's an incredible shift because it's it's not productive. It's 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 I don't know. It's extraordinary. We have one more question. I'll just uh, I'll just read out before we wrap up. Um, and that is from um, <clears throat> uh, Stig, and he says, "What does he think? That's you about Arthur Jensen's formula for probability of genius production: ability times conscientiousness times creativity." I'm a traditionalist psychologist. So in psychology, we, we believe that genius, such as it is, as measured by IQ tests, is essentially biological uh, to some to a large extent and then influenced by... In, the environment allows the biology to express itself. So it's genetic and the environment is just a trigger, a contextual trigger that allows the biology to express. And so we don't, we don't tend to... We don't tend to break down genius into its components or because we believe it's a unitary um, biological determinant. This formula would be rejected by traditional psychology. It has been rejected, actually, by traditional psychology. It's also not what he said. What he said was not that genius was a combination of... He said that achievement was a combination of intelligence plus personality yes, yes. plus yes. some other factor i think it was luck or background or something like that yes so I would, yeah exactly i mean many many very successful entrepreneurs like Stephen jobs and bill gates and you, you name it they said that luck actually is 90 percent of the of the secret the secret sauce uh, and on that i will i will just so, uh, miles clear of civics are you trying to say tom brady and kim kardashian don't deserve to be our heroes ed no, they do deserve to be our heroes. We are in the winter of civilization. Those are the people who our heroes are. It would be weird if they were our heroes 100 years ago. They're our heroes now. I just I just wrote, uh, I mean, a few weeks ago, I wrote an Instagram post that there, there was this institution, higher, higher education institution, a university, and they gave honorary doctorates. And I read the list of honorary doctorates, and it included Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr, and Bertrand Russell, and Taylor Swift. And I thought this encapsulated. It does encapsulate it. I mean, when you're 22, da, 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 you... I mean, she's, she's, done, she, she's done some very catchy tunes. Everything is red. Yeah, she's, in the company, she's in the company of Einstein and Bertrand Russell. She is. She is. She's, she's a very... She's a very um, she says... Um, what's that song she does? Um about breaking up and she says she says uh i i i we, we ain't never getting back together ever yeah i mean it's, it's deep stuff um it's so deep. it is okay well i'd like to thank professor vatman for coming on it's been a very interesting discussion and i shall look up his references to this uh gaby person gabay because i wasn't familiar with that um and is there anything you would like to tell the assembled about future research you're doing or anything before before we wrap up i'm i'm concerned now with uh, with two things basically i'm I'm trying to establish a new paradigm with self-states rather than a unitary self. The second thing I'm doing, I'm trying to demonstrate that narcissists actually reenact early childhood conf conflicts. That's not my insight. That is Freud's insight to start with. But they're trying to reenact it uh, in a way that fully explains the relationship cycle of the narcissist. The narcissist needs to devalue you and discard you because he needs to separate from a maternal figure. So I'm I'm kind of working on a concept called which I call the dual mothership or dual motherhood, where the narcissist casts you when you're his intimate partner, casts you as a maternal figure, and then goes, recreates with you, or reenacts with you the original conflict, and then has to separate from you and become an individual by discarding you and devaluing you. It would provide an explanation to a phenomenon which is very little understood hitherto. We don't, until now, we don't really understand why the narcissist needs to discard you or devalue you. Even if you are the best conceivable intimate partner, you provide him with sex, with supply, with services, with safety, which are the four S's that narcissists are looking for. Why do they get rid of you? And then why do they need to hover you? Do they realize that do they realize that they need you and this is a narcissist this realization is a narcissistic injury or infamous? No, not really, no. Not really, because they don't really need you at any point. 
they just use you. They don't need you. There's no well, need. There. That they like new stimulation, and they've they've done. Not with really, you. not really either. Not really either. Yeah, we, we considered all these explanations. They don't seem to work. It seems that they, it's compulsive. There's a compulsion there, and Freud described it as repetition compulsion. There's a compulsion there, but what was the source of a compulsion? Hitherto, there's no explanation, and I'm trying to present a plausible scenario or a realization that the narcissist, if he regards you as, as his mother, he needs to do with you what he had failed to do with his mother. He failed to separate from his mother. He failed to become an individual, so he needs to separate from you. It's the greatest service that you can render to a narcissist, if you really love him, is to allow him to devalue you and separate from you. But so that's the second thing I'm working on. Jolly good. Okay, well, thanks a lot. This one I'll go on Bit Shoot and Odyssey. I will see you all on Monday and goodbye.